Well, good morning, friends. Welcome back to Hayek Kadosh Ministries, where holiness is a way of life, and Jesus Christ is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And together, the people of God say, Hallelujah. Well, blessings in the name of Jesus, friends. How are you this morning? It is so good to have you back with us. We are continuing our study on the seven churches of Revelation, and today we are at church number six, which is the Church of Philadelphia. Now, if you have your Bibles, open to Revelation chapter 3, and let's begin in verse 7. And as we often do, we'll read from 7 to 13, and then we'll come back and we'll dissect what we have read. So, beginning at verse 7. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth, and no man shutteth, and shutteth, and no man openeth. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews, and are not, but they do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God. And I will write upon him my new name. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Now the first thing that we notice in this text is an extensive title, an opening for the Lord Jesus. For he says of himself, He that is holy... He that is true, he that hath the key of David. He that openeth, and no man shutteth, and shutteth, and no man openeth. Now when he says he's holy, he's pure, he's set apart, he's different from any other. There's no equal to him. He is alone in his Godhead, shared with the Father and the Holy Spirit. All who come before him fall as dead men. The angels cannot look upon him, cannot gaze upon him. He is holy. Just as the human eye cannot capture the glorious beauty and radiance of the sun, nor can his creation capture his beauty, his glory, his majesty, his holiness. He says that he is true. Do you remember when Pilate asked him in John eighteen thirty eight, what is truth? And yet Jesus had already proclaimed about himself, I am the way, the truth, and the life. There are many things that we can doubt, but to doubt in his truth, to doubt in his promises, to doubt in his person, to doubt in his work on Calvary, to doubt in his sanctifying power, to doubt in his liberty and victory over sin that he bestows upon us, to doubt in all the promises that he's offered to us if we will live faithfully before him is a grave mistake, friends. He says that he has the key of David. Now, this is a reference out of Isaiah chapter 22, verse 22, where Eliakim, who is a prime minister of sorts to the king of Israel, holds the key to the entire monarch. And so that key represents power and authority. And what Jesus is saying here is that he alone has sovereign authority to determine who enters into his messianic kingdom. In Revelation 1.18, we're told that Jesus holds the keys to death and hell. And in here in this text, we see that he holds the key to salvation and blessing. Why? Because he is the one who opens and no man can shut. And he is the one who shuts and no man opens. Now, when we read that he opens and no man shuts, immediately our minds should go to an evangelistic effort, maybe even that of a missionary. 
God can open doors into countries that one time did not allow us in there. And yet it was God who closed the doors so that we couldn't enter in at one time. And so he says, I open and no man can shut. I shut and no man can open. Sometimes God shuts the doors in mission areas because his attempt is to create hunger in the people in those areas. I mean, just think about it, for example. The longer a man goes hungry, the hungrier he becomes the more ravenous his appetite. And so it is with the spiritual life, friends, even in our own personal lives. When we go through those dry times, they're there so that we will become hungry for the things of God. And so what sometimes we consider to be a, for lack of a better word, a curse, truly is a blessing. Because as he withdraws from us, or so it seems to us, we hunger. We crave, we desire his presence again to be with us. And that's the whole point of these dry periods. He goes on in verse 8, he says, I know your works. I know how you're living faithfully before me. You're obedient to the things that I've commanded you. And I have set before you an open door. You have an evangelistic opportunity open before you. And no man can shut it. For you do have a little strength. Do you remember when we were told... When I am weak, he is strong. It's not our efforts, our talents, our skills, or our willpower that will create spiritual revival in these evangelistic opportunities. It's his spirit. And he says, yet you do have a little strength. You have kept my word, and you have not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan. Well, who is them? He tells us right here. He says, those who call themselves Jews, and they are not. They lie racially, culturally, ceremonially. They are Jews, but spiritually, they are not Jews. You remember in Romans chapter 2, verse 28, it says, One who is a Jew, not one who is circumcised outwardly, but one who has been circumcised inwardly, the circumcision of the heart, a spiritual circumcision. And they have not experienced this spiritual circumcision they stand upon their own righteousness and not the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And so Jesus tells this young church, don't fear them because I'm going to make them come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved thee. They think that I love them because of all that they're doing in the name of God. But they're going to see that my love has been poured out upon you and I have rejected them. Do you remember when Jesus said some will kill you thinking that they're doing a service to God? And that's what he's saying here. They think that they're serving God, but I have rejected them. It is you that I have accepted because you have been faithful to the door that I've opened before you. What door has he opened before you, friend? Is there someone at work you can reach out to? A neighbor, a family member? Are you working on his behalf to bring others into the kingdom? When is the last time you were rejected? When is the last time you were told to shut up? Do you stand your ground biblically against the LGBT community, homosexuality, drunkenness, lying, cheating, stealing, or do you bite your tongue? If we don't stand up for Jesus, who's going to? He says in verse 10, because you have kept the word of my patience, I also will keep you from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Now, he seems to be alluding here to the fact of the end times, because certainly no one in that day saw the temptation come upon the whole world to try everyone who dwells upon the earth. And so this is a promise that he is making to us even today, and he has to all the church throughout all time. And staying within the same mindset of the end times, he says, I come quickly, so you hold fast that which you have. What do you have? What has he gifted you with? What can you use for his service? What can you use for his glory? Can you teach? Then you should be teaching. Can you sing for his name and exalt him and praise him? Then sing. Can you pray? Then pray. Can you witness? Can you go door to door? Can you bring people into the kingdom? Then start knocking, friends. And notice he says, if you do this, no man will take your crown. And it's interesting he says this because it's not God who causes us to fall away. 
And in all reality, it's not Lucifer that causes us to fall away. Lucifer may cause men's hearts to create grief, anxiety, and problems in our lives that cause us to fall away, but it's other human beings that is oftentimes our enemy. And so he's saying, no matter what they do to you, no, what, no matter what kind of peer pressure that they place upon you, don't let them steal your crown. Don't let them rob you of your place in heaven. If you have to live on this earth as a hermit because you're shunned and ostracized for the stand that you take for the Lord Jesus Christ, then friends live as a hermit. I would encourage you to pray that God would bring other people into your life you can share Jesus' love with. And you can share fellowship with others in their testimony for Christ. But if you don't have that, don't take the mentality that if you can't beat them, join them, which so often happens. And that's what Jesus is warning against here. He says, look, I'm coming quickly. Hold fast what you have. Do not let any man take your crown. Because him that overcomes, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. You will have a steadfast place in the kingdom of God. And you will no more go out. And I will write upon him the name of my God which indicates ownership, the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. In other words, we will know Jesus. We will see Jesus as we've never known him, as we've never seen him before. He will hold nothing back. He will reveal all to us. And no matter what name we give him in our adoration and our praise here on this earth, it will not match, equal, or compare to the name that he will be given. And we will know him as throughout all eternity. And he ends this letter as he does each letter. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. He is holy, friends. You can cast all your cares upon him. He is true. You can place all your trust in him. And he holds the key. He is the power and authority. And we would be wise to surrender to his will and to his way. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, friends. Well, that brings us to the end of our study today. I'm so blessed that you joined us. No matter what you're going through in your life, friends, I hope that you're finding comfort in these letters to these churches. And if there are places where repentance is needed, I pray that you'll repent before him for he is faithful and just to forgive you all your sin. And then he will give you the power and the victory to rise above that sin and to sin no more. That is what he told others. Go and sin no more. And he wouldn't have told us that if we could not accomplish it. And again, I say, hallelujah. I love you, friends. As Yahweh wills, and until next time, I'll see you on the next video.